Good morning, beloved friends. We are so glad you are here, in, whether in person or online, um, on this beautiful sun, summer day after the longest day of the year. Let's take some time now to settle our hearts and our minds as we prepare for this time of worship in this beautiful house of God. God is my shepherd, I won't be wanting, I won't be wanting. He makes me rest in fields of green with quiet streams. Even though morning. That was absolutely beautiful. Good morning. So we have a few prayer requests that we're going to attend to. Rose Dolan would like prayers for healing on her back. And Stacy Christofferson has been ill and would like prayers through her recovery. And prayers for Ray Davis's hip. Thank you for all the work that you put in towards that parsonage, Ray. Really appreciate that. And another request would be for a cordless vacuum for our balcony. If anybody has one that they would love to donate to us, we would love to take that. Now, before I go any further, my name is Shane Coffey. I am the Youth Ministries Director here at Broadway. Uh, a lot of you may know me. My kids got me this awesome shirt for my youth group. Thank you guys 
for my birthday last year. I love it. I love it. And uh, we are a church that doesn't sleep. So we're going to get into some announcements because we are fairly busy. This Wednesday coming up, June 25th, will be beginning at 530. We will be welcoming Pastor Brian. We'll be bringing him on board. There will be a meal. So if you are interested in coming, please sign up at the kiosk outside in the Centrex. Also, like I said, we are a church that doesn't sleep. Also, that same day, Wednesday, beginning at 6 p.m. to 8 p.m., we will be outside playing games with anybody. Anybody who wants to play games. And the cool thing is, is there's going to be, from what I recall, a bounce house, which is going to be a big boxing ring. Now, I'm hoping they have, like, these really ridiculously oversized gloves because that would be awesome. It would be perfect. Because if you know these teenagers, then you're going to laugh. And also as a reminder, next Sunday is the fifth Sunday of the month, so we will be having one service, and that will be being held at 930. So I was told that if you do show up at 830, you show up a little early, there will be donuts and coffee in the lounge. So you don't have to worry about that. (laughs) So 930. And there are more announcements online. I could probably go all day talking about all the things that this church is doing, but right now, let's center ourselves. Let's take a deep breath in. Let's let it out. It's nice. Let's prepare ourselves for our next song. As has been our practice here at Broadway, this time of song and scripture is your time with God. So feel free to stand or sit, whatever feels most comfortable in your body. And please know that this first song is quite repetitive, but it's on purpose because it allows ourselves to get deeper and deeper into our souls with song. Please stand if you desire and you are able. forgiven because you were forsaken I'm accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again I'm forgiven because you were forsaken accepted you were condemned I'm alive and well your spirit is within me because you died and rose again amazing love how can it be that you my king would die
2 Corinthians chapter 6, verses 1 through 13, the message. Companions, as we are in this work with you, we beg you, please don't squander one bit of this marvelous life God has given us. God reminds us, I heard your call in the nick of time. The day you needed me, I was there to help. Well, now is the right time to listen, the day to be helped. Don't put it off. Don't frustrate God's work by showing up late, throwing a question mark over everything we're doing. Our work as God's servants gets validated, or not, in the details. People are watching us as we stay at our post, alertly, unswervingly, in hard times, tough times, bad times, when we're beaten up, jailed, and mobbed, working hard, working late, working without eating, with pure heart, clear head, steady hand, in gentleness, holiness, and honest love. When we're telling the truth and when God's showing his power, when we're doing our best setting things right, when we're praised and when we're blamed, slandered and honored, true to our word, though distrusted, ignored by the world, but recognized by God, terrifically alive, though rumored to be dead, beaten within an inch of our lives, but refusing to die, immersed in tears, yet always filled with deep joy, living on handouts, yet enriching many, having nothing, having it all. Dear, dear Corinthians, I can't tell you how much I long for you to enter this wide open, spacious life. We didn't fence you in. The smallness you feel comes from within you. Your lives aren't small, but you're living them in a small way. I'm speaking as plainly as I can and with great affection. Open up your lives. Live openly and expansively. When you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down, Spirit, when you move, you make my heart pound. When you fill the room, you're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. Come down,
You're here and I know you are moving. I'm here and I know you will fill me. You fill us, Lord. Oh, your spirit's moving. Come rest on us now. Holy Spirit. Spirit touch us. Lord, we pray that we can soak up your light, your light so that we can spread it to others. We all come to you in different phases, different times, different troubles, different joys. But we know that your love, your grace, and your being with us there's always enough. Thank you so much, God, for all you do and for the ways you help us out when we may not even notice. disciples. Kinnick is going to lead us and all these other kiddos. Do you need a microphone? Yeah, I probably do. Good morning, guys. So Kinnick has a really fun question that he wants to ask all of you. So I'm going to let him ask you this question because well, I'll ask, and then you give me an answer. How about that? Okay, well, well first we'll start off. How's all, how, have, how have all you guys this summer's been? Good. Good? Good? So, so let's, okay, Shane, you can ask the question. Oh, okay. What do you think that children in the Bible did during their summers a long, long time ago? What do you think they did? Can it, do you have one that can start them off, maybe? I think they went swimming because it was really hot and you know it, yeah. there's always been water so you can always go swimming you guys got any ideas throwing rocks <laughs> 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 uh, 
Like having fun with people. Anyone else have anything? I think they did chores. Chores, you think they did chores? I'm with you. I think they did a lot of work. I think abled bodies did a lot of work. But they had to do stuff for fun, right? Yep. I mean, chores were fun, I guess. Better than work. I mean, we look at them at the same, but they were probably different. There's probably then. a lot more outside chores instead of inside chores. I mean, there wouldn't have been cleaning your room. There was probably picking stuff up out in the, I don't know. In the wilderness. In the wilderness. Is that what you were going to say? In the wilderness. Cleaning, cleaning the garden. The garden. So back in the back in the Bible, they used they, they swam a lot. That they, they did throw rocks. They used to have competitions to see who could lift the biggest rock. I, I think Shane could lift the biggest rock. You guys think? No? I don't know about that. I've got pretty big kids. My money's on one of my children. Maybe then, that one. They also used to. They did hang out with their friends and. Uh, another thing they like to do was to fish a lot. It was like, that was like their chore. They fish, and they bring the fish back to their family. But it was fun. It was fun. That was their fun chore. So fishing was a way of life. What is something that you guys have done this summer that's been a lot of fun? Yeah. Um, going to Boys and Girls Club. Nice. Anybody else? Just one person did only one fun thing. Going to the splash pad a lot. Yeah, splash pad. What have you done fun this summer, Shannon? Hung out by the pool. Heck yeah. <laughs> Anybody else? I just went to Colorado. It was great. With family. It was wonderful. Sports. Oh yeah, sports. Sports are a big thing. You got anything? What did you do? What did you what was that? We went to Minnesota. Did you have so much fun? What was your favorite part about Minnesota? Mall of America. Oh, yeah. Um, That's my favorite part was Great Wolf Lodge. Oh, I'm jealous. I'm super jealous. <laughs> Wrap up. Pray out. Is there anybody who wants to pray out for us? Yeah, Shannon's going to volunteer. Okay. I came up because I heard we were all children of God, so I thought I'd give it a shot. Yeah. All right, let's pray us out. That's you right. ready to do an echo prayer? All right. Dear God, Dear God. thank you for summer. Thank you for summer. And games. And games. And lots of fun. And lots of fun. Help us to have a safe, wonderful summer. Help us have a safe, wonderful summer. Amen. Amen. Good job, Kenneth. As we remain in this time of prayer together, may we remember that prayer is how we communicate with God. And it's also in prayer that we share our deepest desires of our hearts, and it's where we offer our thanksgivings and concerns for ourselves, others, and the world. Prayer also means taking the time to be in silence with our beloved God, to listen deeply to the groanings of the Holy Spirit within, or to perhaps be open to new perspectives. It's in the silence when we are met yet again by God and bathed in God's deep and all-encompassing love for us. We'll do a little, something a little different during prayer time today. So you will be invited to start with your hands placed on your heart space. And about halfway through, I will invite you to place your hands with your palms down, to send the love to the earth and those around you. And lastly, I will invite you to, to stand or sit with your palms open to receive. So let's begin with our prayers and our hands on our heart. Dear friends, let us pray. God, we thank you that you are a God who listens. You are ever more ready to listen than we are to speak. 
And so we thank you not only for listening, but also for sending your spirit to intercede when we are in a place of no words. God, we thank you that you are a God who stays with us in the midst of transition. You are a God who remains present in our joys and in times of celebration. You are also a God who remains present in our grief, our fears, our anxieties, and our uncertainties. You are a God who has already been, who currently is, and will continue to go ahead of wherever we are going. You simply ask us to trust you and to loosen our grip as we journey into the next phases of life. God, we ask that you continue every day to remind us of who you are and who we are in you. You are invited to place your palms facing down. God, we pray for those who are hurting for those who feel they have to fight to be healthy, for those who are facing an illness, for those who are fighting to be healthy in their mind and in their heart, for those who are suffering. God, we pray for those who are starting to wonder if their earthly fight is over. We pray for those who have loved and lost their loved ones, for those who are experiencing indescribable grief. We pray for those who are feeling lonely and rejected. We pray for those who struggle to simply get out of bed. God, may you wrap them in your love. May they experience your love from those around them whether through strangers or friends. We pray for those who come to mind now, whether aloud or in our hearts. May they know they are children of God. God, we pray for our global community. We pray for a world full of people who are in conflict, for people who spew fear because we ourselves are afraid. Remind us, God, that you have created us in your image to be vessels of your love. Remind us that we may love and stand with those who are experiencing hate and injustice. And remind us that your love for us turns into love for others even when loving feels like the very last thing we want to do. God, we pray for our world leaders, that they may have the desire to care for and heal our beautiful planet. We pray that they would set aside their own agendas so that they may hear the concerns of the greater global community. We pray for those who are experiencing flooding and storms that we've seen in in the world in recent months. We pray for those who are worried about their crops and for those who have been displaced. God, in all of these worries, pray, we pray for moments of peace so that we may be more aware of who you are. Turn your palms up. God, we give thanks for all that you have provided. You know what we need even when we don't. You have provided all that we need for today. Help us release our feelings over not having enough and remind us that you alone sustain us. Remind us that when we do not have enough, we are called to share. And God, we give thanks for your presence in this place, for the community forming here at Broadway. We give thanks for this time to reset and to prepare our hearts and minds for what is to come. And above all else, God, remind us that what we need is you, that you are the love in our hearts, and you are the air that we breathe. You are what bind us together. 
for it is in you that we feel most whole and most loved, for it is in you that we are sustained. God, we offer all these things along with the yearnings of our own hearts. And God, we ask you to listen to us now as we offer up the prayer Jesus taught us. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come. morning. I'm back. They just keep letting me up here all the time. I'm trying to figure it out too, but you know what? It's kind of fun. So today's scripture is going to be from the book of Luke, chapter 6, verse 27. And I'll be reading from the Common English Bible. But I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies Do good to those who hate you. And here ends our reading. Spirit of God, stir up your people. So I know commonly there's a lot more to this verse. I know commonly we continue on with it, but see, I wanted to stop here at just one verse. And to some people, when they hear that I'm only going to be preaching on one verse, they're like, is that it? Is that all you got? This is really loaded. This is really, really loaded. And we're going to break it down a little bit, and we're going to discuss this, because God, or Jesus says, but I say to you who are willing to hear, love your enemies. I'm going to be honest with you right now. If I could remove any scripture or any verse from the Bible, it would be this one. It would be this one. And don't confuse this. I'm not saying that I want to, I want to hate all my enemies, Okay. That's not what I'm saying. I'm saying that this is hard. This is a hard thing to live your life by. This is something that is so difficult, most people don't ever do it. Let's turn our attention to one of the most radical and challenging teachings of Jesus found in Luke. But I say to you who are willing to hear, for those of you who are willing to hear, it doesn't mean that these people couldn't hear him. It doesn't mean that they were disabled. It doesn't mean that they weren't listening. What it means is, is did they have an open ear? See, Jesus knew that when he was talking to these people, that some of them didn't have an open mind, an open heart. They weren't going to listen to this. He knows that it's completely counterintuitive. It doesn't naturally happen to you. This isn't something that's, that's just going to happen. It's countercultural. It's not something that's just going to be mimicked and happen to you out in the wild or in public sometimes for that matter. He's saying, for those of you who actually want to hear what I'm saying, who want to listen to my words, open up your ears, and this is what he says. I'm speaking to you, to those with the open minds. Love your enemies, and do good to those who hate you. I want to take a moment to look at these words, because Luke spoke in high Greek. Okay, Luke spoke very fancy. In fact, Luke was a doctor, and when Luke spoke... He spoke more medically than the Greek doctor of the time, Hippocrates, who's the father of medicine, if that'll break it down for you a little bit. So when you look at the word enemy, it's actually a military term. The definition is one that's antagonistic into another, especially one seeking to injure, overthrow, or confound a, a component. Someone who is hostile and hating. So Jesus is saying to love those who've actually set themselves up against you. Those who want you to fail. Those who want you to hurt mentally, physically, maybe relationally. He's telling you to love them. I mean, that seems easy, right? Love somebody who absolutely despises you. Then he goes on even further and says, now I want you to do good to those who hate you. Now, he's talking about the ones who just can't stand you, the ones that can't stand your name, the ones who can't stand to be around you. And I'm guessing, because I'm not the only one, 
that some of you guys have felt that way about somebody. You've had a conflict towards somebody. Even their name in your ears makes you feel something you shouldn't. Maybe that you heard something negative happen to them, and you're like, oh, darn. No? Am, am I bad? Is it, I'm just looking horrible up here? <laughs> Come on. This is the human condition. This is something that we can all relate to. But Jesus is saying to those people who hate you and hate everything about you, he wants you to be good to them. All right? So let's look at this. Jesus says, I want you to love your enemies and do good to those who hate you. All right. That's it, right? Let's pray on this. I'm just kidding. We're not going to pray on this. What goes through your mind when you hear this or when you read this? Because I'll tell you what goes through my mind. Impossible. Difficult. I'm not doing this. Like, how do you expect me to love somebody who despises me, hates me? Maybe he's verbally abusive towards me. You want me to love them? Like, draw a line in the sand and hug them? What goes through your mind when you read this? Wounded. That's what goes through my mind. If I need to love somebody and I have an instant negative effect or reaction towards this, I've been wounded. Love your enemies. Do good to those who hate you. This commandment's not merely about our actions. See, it challenges us to adopt a completely new perspective on love, relationships, and even life itself. Shifting our perspective can empower us to live in this command in profound, transformative ways. To understand the weight of Jesus' words, we must first consider this perspective. In his original audience, the people were underneath Roman occupation. I mean, they were experiencing daily oppression, injustice. Their enemies were real and they were present, causing significant suffering and hardship. And the natural response to somebody like that is anger and resentment and desire for revenge. But yet Jesus calls them for something radically different. Love. So like I said, Luke speaks in high Greek. And when you speak in high Greek, it isn't just saying love. It's not like I say, I love a candy bar. I love ice cream. Who loves ice cream? I love ice cream. Or I love my wife. It's a different type. I love my wife. <laughs> but it is a different type of love. See, I wish that when they translated a lot of this Greek to our language, they would have just kept some of these words the way they were. For example, like baptism. Baptismo. So baptism means to dunk or immerse in water. And it doesn't really encompass the same words if you said Jesus dunked them in the river or Jesus, you know, it, it, it just a, it doesn't have the same ring. But when baptismo became baptism, it does. So with the word agape, agape, it's so much deeper than the emotional word love. Agape is a deep commitment. It's a deep commitment to an internal, it's an internal commitment to the betterment of another person. It's actually saying, I am committed to this person, and it's deeper than that emotion that we say love. So when Jesus is talking here, this is what he's saying. I'm giving you some things to do. Commit your mind, no matter how you feel, Commit in your mind and your actions that everything you do is going to be for the betterment of those who've set themselves against you. For the betterment of the people who have set themselves against you on purpose, mind you. So everything you say and everything that you do is something for the betterment of that person. Know that it makes it easier, right? Absolutely not. Absolutely not. I know it actually seems that it's more difficult, but it gives us really a starting point, doesn't it? Because we're already looking at this hurdle like, this is, this is an impossibility. But see, God isn't going to give us something that we can't handle. <clears throat> Loving our enemies requires a hard shift in perspective. It demands that we see people not as adversaries, but as individuals. And it means recognizing that every person is loved by God and is worthy of our love and compassion. And the shift from seeing them as enemies to seeing them as fellow humans is the first step to fulfilling Jesus' command. It can be difficult when somebody is mean to you, but it isn't that difficult. Think about this. How hard is it to be mean to somebody who is super nice to you? Like, you just want to be angry, but they're so pleasant. 
You can't be angry. All you can do is smile back and think, boy, that was weird. So Jesus embodies this perspective of love throughout his ministry. He consistently showed love and compassion to those who were marginalized, despised, and even hostile towards him. Think of his interaction with the Roman centurion, his conversation with the Samaritan woman, and his healing of the servant of the high priest, who actually came to arrest him. In each instance, Jesus looked at, looked at them beyond the societal labels and saw the person of God's love instead, with grace. To love our enemies as Jesus commands, we must try to be intentional. And I say try, because, let's be honest, it can be a difficult path. So we need to try and be intentional to cultivate this new perspective in our daily lives by praying for our enemies, asking God to bless them, and help them to see through his eyes. Prayer soften our, it softens our hearts, and it aligns us with the perspective of God's. We can try to understand our enemy's situations, and we might be driving their actions. Empathy breaks down barriers and it helps us relate to others on a human level, and we need to look and continue to look for opportunities to do good things to those who dislike us. Small acts of kindness can open doors to healing and reconciliation like no other. Release any bitterness or desire for revenge. Forgiveness is not about excusing wrong behavior, but it's about freeing ourselves from the chains of anger and resentment. We all have that. You know, we, we have somebody who's who's trespassed against us, and here we are thinking, I can't forgive this person. If I forgive them, I'm teaching them how they can properly treat me bad. If I forgive them, I'm letting them walk all over me because I'm like, oh, I'm a pushover. But that's not actually the case. Revenge and resentment can be a consuming thing. If it's all you think about, it will consume you. People don't resent other people or want revenge on other folks unless they are hurting. And when you're going through pain, it doesn't matter what degree of pain you're going through. You can stub your finger, stub your toe. It consumes you. You can have a toothache. It consumes you. You can have your feelings hurt. You can be going through relationship problems. It consumes you. Now, I spend time and I ask my students, what's been consuming you this week? And the reason why I ask them is that because something that can consume you so much will actually emit from you. How many of you guys have seen somebody like that who's just so consumed with these other things in their lives, maybe something negative that all they emit is negativity? And they don't even realize it. They're watching the news or they're or listening to the radio and all they do is they repeat all these things that they continue to hear. They're consumed by it. Your kids play video games. All they want to do is talk about video games. They're consumed by it. They listen to music. They hang out with friends. They're consumed by those things. Now, not all things are bad to be consumed by, but remember, these things are also a distraction. Today, I want you to say, today I want to say to you that you may look at your life and think that it isn't a big deal when you're consumed by something. Well, let me say this. If it's something you're thinking about, a lot. It is a big deal. If it's something that's consuming your thoughts, it is a big deal. If your heart's wounded, it's a very big deal. Adopting Jesus' perspective on love transforms not only our relationships, but our entire way of life. When we love our enemies, we break down this cycle of hatred and violence. And I like to think that we're really kind of like these special agents of peace and reconciliation in a world desperately in need of both. Our actions rooted in this new perspective have the power to change hearts and minds. Think of Martin Luther King Jr. who advocated for nonviolence resistance and love in the face of severe racial injustice. His perspective was grounded in the teachings of Jesus and it led to significant strides in the civil rights movement. Another example I'm a history fan, so some of you may know this, and some of you may not know this. Corey Ten Boom, a Dutch Christian who helped many Jews escape the Nazis during World War II. This brave act of defiance eventually got her and her sister arrested and sent to Ravensbrück. 
a notorious concentration camp. And after the war, she met one of her former guards and chose to forgive him. Her love and forgiveness, even towards somebody who's caused immense suffering, is a powerful testament to the power of adopting Jesus' perspective. That sounds easy, doesn't it? This whole forgiving and, and love and perspective of love. Of course it does. Once we get over that human condition part. For those of you who don't know what I'm talking about, the human condition can be defined as characteristics of key events in the human life, right? You have birth, learning, emotion, aspiration, morality, conflict, and death. So where does faith fit into that? Faith frames who we are, our existence, our values, our hopes, our dreams. Faith is the quiet before the storm, and it is the anchor in the middle of that storm. Faith also has a misconception that it's always about winning. The Bible states that the human condition is not only filled with broken relationships and human attempts to mend them, but it also includes God. Who has, turned, who has not turned away from the disobedient, but has given them salvation. Understand this. I struggle with this, and I completely recognize it. I do. I think a lot of us do. I know that this is going to be a lifelong process, and until we die or Jesus comes back, we're going to be battling this very topic. This is the reality of our lives, but this is also necessary. This is the command of Jesus for us to live our lives better, healthier. And as we wrap up, remember, love your enemies. This is what Jesus is calling us to do, but differently. When we respond with love, even when it's hard, by doing this, we're bringing light into the world. Amen? Amen. We're going to take this moment to do offering, but as we're doing offering, we're going to show a video to show you where some of your offerings kind of go. And I get to, to say this because it's my ministry, but it's to youth ministry and the things that we do in the church, outside of the church, and all these wonderful things that your contribution helps with. Being a teenager at Broadway can be a developing experience filled with both challenges and growth opportunities. As young people navigate the complexities of adolescence, Broadway provides a unique space where they can explore their faith, build lasting relationships, and develop a strong moral foundation. Youth groups are especially important in this journey. They offer a supportive community where teens can share their struggles, joys, and questions in a safe and understanding environment. Through regular meetings, events, and activities, youth groups can create opportunities for spiritual growth and personal development. These groups often serve as a second family, a church family providing guidance and encouragement during the turbulent teenage years. In student life, teenagers have the chance to engage with their faith in a more personal and dynamic way. They participate in discussions that address real life issues, learn how to apply biblical principles to everyday situations, and are encouraged to ask difficult questions and seek genuine answers. This active involvement helps to build robust and resilient faith that can withstand the pressures and doubts that often come with growing up. In essence, being a teenager in church and participating in student life is about finding a place where you belong, where your faith can flourish, and where you can grow into a person you are meant to be. It's about building a foundation that will support you throughout your life, no matter what challenges come your way. In July, student life will be headed to summer games for a one-week camp held at Grinnell College in Grinnell, Iowa. It's designed to help build a stronger relationship with Jesus, make new friends, and become a more involved member in your local church. Dive in to worship themes, messages, and songs that help you understand and feel God's love. It's a powerful way to connect with your faith and feel inspired. They will spend time studying the Bible and learning about Jesus' teachings. Meet and connect with teens from across the state and form meaningful relationships that last a lifetime. It's just a really fun and engaging way to strengthen your faith, make new friends, and get ready to be an active part of your church community. If you haven't joined us yet and you're curious, come and start out small. Visit us on a Sunday or a Wednesday night. I promise you won't be disappointed. Good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me.
broken dreams and wasted years till the past to disappear. Let me tell you about my Jesus and all the wrong turns that you would go and undo if you could. Who can make it all for your good? Let me tell you about my Jesus. His makes a way where there ain't no way. Rises up from an empty grave. Ain't no sinner that he can say. Let me tell you about my Jesus. His love is strong and his grace is free. Good news is I know that he can do for you what he's done for me. Let me tell you about my Jesus. Let my Jesus Jesus the Son and the Holy Spirit, let us leave this place loving and caring and standing with each other. Amen. <laughs>